four bells it be. Are you ready to podcast? Aye, I am ready. Are you ready? Aye, I'm ready. I'm ready. You know, when people see the podcast, they say, there she blows. And <laughs> that's the YouTube comment section, I suppose. Aye, aye. Shiver aye. me timbers. We are in, uh, uh, we are, we're in some hot water here. <laughs> aye, that'd be true. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Wolf of Wednesdays. Nathan reads a series of unfortunate events. Ignore the tattoo. My name is Nathan. And I'm Tyler. And if you are new to this, uh, we are reading through all of the books in... Look at that. We've got like a strobe <laughs> effect. This is amazing. Yeah, the button of my light is busted, so it just keeps flickering on and off. It can't decide whether it wants to be on. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, I think it's settled now. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if you're new to the podcast, you can see that this is extremely high budget. And we are reading through a series of unfortunate events, all 13 books. I'm reading the series for the first time. Tyler, you've read the series multiple times, including as a middle grade reader. We are on book the 11th, The Grim Grotto. And specifically, we are looking at chapters one to four this week. And then next week, it'll be chapters five to eight. And the week after that, chapters nine to 13. Yep. Um, yeah, and uh, so we're going to get started with the Grim Grotto in a moment here, but I believe we have a sponsor for this week. We do. So our sponsor for this week is a very obscure novel. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it before. Somehow I had it in my book collection. It's called Moby Dick, Moby Dick, I, I don't know, mm. by Herman Melville. Um, so mm. it, it seems to at least have some obscure meaning in a series of unfortunate events. But we do have one of the best book critics of all time, Klaus Baudelaire, who is just a renowned book critic who has spoken to what Melville is, is doing in Moby Dick, where he says that um, Melville is one of my favorite authors. I really enjoy the way he dramatizes the plight of overlooked people, such as poor sailors or exploited youngsters, through his strange, often experimental philosophical prose. Um, so that's high praise indeed from one of the greatest book critics of all time, Klaus Absolutely. Baudelaire. Yeah, yeah, certainly the most well-read 13-year-old, uh, I think, in a generation, at least. That's right. Yeah. There is no book in existence that he has not only heard of, but understands perfectly. Yep. <laughs> perfectly. <laughs> so go out and get Moby Dick today if you can somehow find it. Again, I don't know. What a strange, obscure reference that this is. Yeah, absolutely. I know. I'm I'm going to have to look into it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, of course, being an English teacher, I've never heard of it before. Yeah. <laughs> All right, folks, I hope you enjoy. Ignore the tattoo! Nathan unfortunately reads a series of unfortunate events at an unfortunate age, which in this case is being used to indicate that he is entirely too old to be reading this for the first time. Book the 11th, The Grim Grotto, chapters 1 to 4. So we are getting there. We're getting pretty close to the end of the series. You had promised me that the, the last three books, as best you remember, that they zip along pretty well, that it doesn't feel like we've got some narrative stalling, which we've seen in some of the other books, where he's, mm -hmm. you know, holding back and holding back and holding back. And so far, I have to say, these are four of the most enjoyable chapters in the entire series. Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> like, I, I was... I was pleasantly surprised um even with having fairly high expectations reasonably speaking but fairly high expectations because you said that you had good memories of this book so mm -hmm. i'm like okay okay so this should hold up pretty well and then i read chapters one to four and i went oh okay yeah that like i say they are some of the the strongest chapters i think in the entire series yeah absolutely um all right and uh, i am on plot summary duty this week so i yep. think i will hop right into it uh so we start off with the baudelaire's uh you know floating down stricken stream which is where we left off uh, at the end of uh, the slippery slope and um they encounter uh a submarine uh mm -hmm. a periscope which is attached to a submarine uh they then board the submarine uh and find that there is Captain Wittershins and his stepdaughter Fiona, um, as well as they eventually find out that Phil from yes. from Partridge, 
Partryville's Paltryville's um, uh, Lucky Smells Lumber Mill. Yes, uh, then the he Optimist. Has, yes, the Optimist. Then he has uh, also become a part of the uh, what is it? The the submarine Q and its crew of two. Yes, <laughs> the Queequeg. Yes. Uh, appropriately named, of course. Um, and, uh, yeah, and so then they are searching after the Sugar Bowl. That is their main task aboard the Queequeg, although we still are not sure about what is so important about the Sugar Bowl. Yeah. And as, <laughs> as Captain Wittershins points out, oh, you shouldn't be troubled by the importance of it. It's it's too uh, horrifying <laughs> for you to know. Um, too dangerous for you to note something along those lines. Um, so they're yeah. on board the submarine. Wittershins has a bunch of different tasks for each of the different Baudelaire's. And then um, some other uh, submarine appears on their radar. And it is in the shape of an octopus. Um, although on the uh, <laughs> on their radar screen, it has the appearance of an eye. Um mm. And then uh, there is a third thing underwater, some mysterious question mark shaped thing that they don't really yeah. know what it is, <laughs> yeah. um, which is absolutely terrifying to Wittershins and Fiona. But, yep. yep. Uh, and I think that's about it for plot. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, um, you know, each of the, the kids has been assigned a task. Mm -hmm. Right. Where you've got um, Violet, who is in charge of fixing up this submarine that doesn't work very well. And it's great that to have her because of her inventing skills. And then Klaus is in charge of reading title charts because he's such a such a great researcher. So it doesn't <laughs> matter what it is. You know what I mean? Architectural blueprints. I'm sure he could read those. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, like mathematical graphs. He could read those title charts. Sure. He could read those, like anything. Anything yep. that is printed, he can read. Mm -hmm. um, and so, <laughs> uh, yeah, he's in charge of the title charts to figure out where the sugar bowl has gone because it got thrown out the window into Stricken Stream and then went off somewhere. So he's going to somehow be able to figure this out. And then Sonny, of course, who is a budding chef, is in charge of the galley. Yep, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and I have to say, this, this book, I think, in particular right out of the gate setting up that each of them have their own tasks and that they are so appropriate for who they are it just it works really well <laughs> yeah you know like each on... one has got something that makes sense for them to do yeah yeah sometimes you can see that handler is desperately trying to come up with a task for one or two of them and he's like um sure inventing skills could be useful here or sure teeth yes. could be useful here but in this case genuinely these are good tasks for each of the kids yeah um all right so hopping into our notes uh did you want to go first for chapter one sure and before we get into that I, the dedication is appropriate for a seafaring <laughs> book right dead women yes. tell no tales sad men write them down mm -hmm. so you know um that, that's good it's good pirate talk <laughs> absolutely <laughs> uh on page 212 this is just a, a quick question that i have where at the top of the page it says what is it violet said i don't know klaus said it's hard to tell from so high up because they're um, high up in in the mountains like coming down the stream and they're trying to perceive what's going on, but it's basically looking at the hinterlands and the hinterlands are on fire. And then they have all this guilt, even though they should have zero guilt about this because this is not their fault in the least. But right. anyway, they somehow think, oh, because we added a match to an inferno, then we are somehow also responsible for this. But then what Sunny says here is subjavic. Sunny said, mm -hmm. and she spoke the truth. Do you think that's supposed to be subjective? I'm not sure if it's supposed to be that. Um, I had looked it up as well. And uh, there is a, a website which breaks down uh, what each of um, Sonny's words probably means. Yeah. Um, and they had it as, 
I'm just going to pull it up. Uh, possibly derived from sub and uh, Reykjavik, meaning the Bay of Smokes. So dark it was unrecognizable. So it is a sea of smoke and um, yeah, so I'm not sure. I feel like that's a bit of a stretch. And I think that subjective would be a better interpretation of that. Yes, because they're trying to look at what's going on here. They gasp at what they saw. What is it Violet said? I don't know, Klaus said. It's hard to tell from so high up. Subjective, right? right? Like yeah. that makes more sense of based off of our point of view, it's hard to tell. And so it can be interpreted in different ways. Mm -hmm. I, but I don't know because it, it doesn't fit with anything. Really. Right. It's not exactly, it's not subjective, it's subjavic. But yeah. I think it's maybe close enough that's what it's supposed to mean. Or it could just be nonsense. Yep. <laughs> All right, turning to page 20. Um, and this is my last note for chapter one. Then at the top of the page here, well, actually, let me just um, get a little bit of context here. Um, oh, this is when the, the submarine, when the periscope shows up and they're deciding whether they should go in there or not. And the hatch opens and then, hello, Violet cried. Hello, Klaus cried. Shalom, Sunny shrieked over the sound of the rushing stream. The Baudelaire's heard a very dim sound coming from behind the latch. And so it's just, you know, they don't know who it is, but this is an interesting reference to Hebrew, right, to, mm -hmm. to say shalom, because shalom means um, nothing, it, it means a, a sense of wholeness or completeness. Mm. Um, kind of the, the best way of understanding shalom is nothing missing, nothing broken, that it's complete or not necessarily perfect, but whole, right? So if you wish somebody shalom, then you're saying like wholeness on you, where there's nothing missing, nothing broken in your life, that everything is okay. Gotcha. Yeah, I definitely read that as just a, you know, greeting, um, you know, oh. kind of just another hello, but okay. Yeah, no, that's... in ancient Hebrew, that's what it means. Mm. Um, it's a sense of wholeness. Interesting. So it's just, it's, it's obvious. I mean, we, we have talked about it before. The handler, he um, is by ethnicity Jewish, but I believe he's non-practicing. Right. And so it, it would make sense, though, that especially if he went, if he you know, had a, a bar mitzvah, then he would have learned Hebrew and Shalom is, you know, I don't know, top five in words to know if you know any words in Hebrew. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. it's unsurprising that he throws that in there. And I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know beyond that other than just, there you go. You have a little bit of ancient Hebrew thrown in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, I, uh, I only have one note for this chapter, which is on page 14. Uh, and this is uh, toward the top of the page. Uh, Violet says, uh, Sonny's right, Violet said. Uh, we didn't think up the plot, Olaf did. And then Klaus says, we didn't stop him either, Klaus pointed out. And plenty of people think we're entirely responsible. Um, and so this is kind of what we were talking about uh, before, where it's this idea of, you know, all all that is uh, needed for evil to succeed is for good people to do nothing. It's yes. like they have had opportunities time and time again to stop Olaf. Um, maybe not time and time again, but they have had, you know, a They've few a opportunities. Few. Yeah. And that they just, you know, haven't done that because they're like, oh, we can't be villains. And it's like, well, now you're not doing anything. Right. And so you're still kind of responsible. And so it's this. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very interesting Thing that it comes up immediately after we were talking about that. <laughs> yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right that it is significant that that comes up because yeah, no, that's the Edmund Burke quote. But it, it absolutely makes sense if you said something like you know, well, the Nazis kill people, so if we kill Nazis, we're as bad as Nazis. Then it's like then you just want the like the complete extermination of all Jewish people to go on. Like you want the Holocaust to be complete you want hitler to take over the entire world because you're going to allow that to happen right that right. Yeah. it's just to to say we can't stoop to his level and it's like well motivation does actually factor in what's mm -hmm. your motive behind this you know what yeah. i mean yeah. if you like go to war with a, a group of people to stop a genocide from occurring mm -hmm. then that's not the same as going to war with people because you want their land 
great. <laughs> like it's just like motive matters. I don't know yeah. why. It's just it's such simplistic moralizing. But anyway. Uh, all right. So moving on to uh, chapter two, I suppose I'll uh, keep going with my notes here. Sure. Um, so my first note is on page 31. As we had mentioned before, uh, the fact that the uh, submarine is named the Queequeg is uh, a reference or not even a reference. It is a direct, um, you know, inspiration from uh, the character from Herman Melville's Moby Dick. Um, who accompanied uh, uh, Captain Ishmael? Is that right? No. Um, have I'm you sorry. Read it? That's okay. Have you I read have not it? read it. <laughs> okay. Um, Ishmael is just one of the the crew members on the Pequod, and Captain Ishmael is the captain of the ship. But then, Ishmael is the the narrator of the story. Right. So sorry, he's... Captain Ahab is yes. the captain. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> and then. Ishmael meets Queequeg before they they meet Ahab or um, join the crew of the Pequod. Okay. And um, yeah, and then Queequeg, then he's Polynesian. He's from the South Seas. And um, yeah, so he is a ethnic minority, but him and Ishmael are essentially, Ishmael is a, a white sailor. They're treated equally and like Ishmael treats him well. Like there's no distinction between them on the ship okay yeah cool. that it's it's sort of yeah I, I mean i could talk about moby dick all day long so <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure anyway but that's the reference though it's just and there doesn't seem to be much more to it yeah other than captain Wittershins clearly having an admiration for um uh herman melville who of course is plastered all over their uniforms. <laughs> yeah. But for some I, strange reason. <laughs> yeah, my point though is I don't know what what the significance is other than this is considered like Moby Dick is considered to be, you know, perhaps the the greatest seafaring novel of all time. Mm. Right. And it's one of the you know what I mean, anything to do with sailing? And certainly yeah, as a 19th century book. I, yeah, I think that um, part of it is, as we had mentioned during the uh, the intro, um, with Klaus's, uh, you know, observation of uh, what Melville seems to be interested in, uh, which is the less fortunate and all that, then that yeah. ties into, you know, a series of unfortunate events. Um, I think that that's what, handler was trying to go for maybe uh, um i guess olaf can also be seen as a captain ahab type character where ahab is obsessed with avenging um mm. you know the the um the white whale right, right. that took his yeah. leg and that he <laughs> you know everyone else be damned he's going to get this whale right that it doesn't matter right. how much he endangers everyone on the his crew and he doesn't necessarily care about them because it's all in his personal singular quest for revenge and that maybe Olaf is supposed to be set up as an Ahab type character mm. yeah I could see that yeah because of course uh, again my understanding of Moby Dick is that uh, Captain Ahab is just completely obsessed with this yes. Um, yes. throwing all else to the winds right uh, in search of this one goal and right yeah that certainly is yeah uh, what we have with olaf so yeah i could see that yeah the more i think about it the more i go okay yeah this is i guess a bit more than just a random reference and just they both take place at sea um mm -hmm. it, it would just it would make a little bit more sense to me if it was uh olaf's ship or submarine that was mm. named you know, Pequod or Queequeg or Melville or something like that, because I associate right. him more with that. But, but it's fine. Yeah. Um, all right. So moving on on page uh, thirty nine, um, we uh, we get this discussion of um, well, yeah, this is where we get uh, Klaus describing it. Uh, I really enjoy the way. He, meaning Herman Melville, dramatizes the plight of overlooked people, 
such as poor sailors or exploited youngsters um, through his strange, often experimental, philosophical prose. And so, I mean, I don't... Handler is clearly trying to put himself along those same levels. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I mean, I'm just, I'm just no. saying that that's... That, no, that he's equating right. himself there and yes. not necessarily saying that he's as good, but that he's certainly doing the same kind of thing where he's like, oh, yeah, look, see, I'm dramatizing this plight of orphans and, you know, exploited youngsters. Um, and I have a strange experimental type of prose. And it's not exactly philosophical, but it is certainly experimental i guess <laughs> yes i mean it was experimental in the restoration era a couple right. hundred years ago <laughs> so sure it's experimental <laughs> um, yeah even calling melville's prose experimental is like no but okay <laughs> um <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's really not but that's fine too i mean he's not like T.S. Eliot or Ezra Pound or something like that. I don't, I don't get, like, not that they're prose writers or poets, but still. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's um, an interesting thing that he does um, bring this up. I guess I don't have a lot of patience for this idea of saying, because he's focusing in on the Baudelaire's, then this is him dramatizing the plight of overlooked people, such as poor sailors or exploited youngsters. And I guess my point would be these trust fund kids, literally they are trust fund kids who have grown up in absolute privilege until their parents are killed, but they've grown up in absolute privilege and they're only three years away as long as they can withstand Olaf and all of this, then they are three years away from having this massive fortune again. Right. That that is not the same thing as somebody like Queequeg from Moby Dick. That's right. not even close to the same thing. And then to say, you know, oh, let me choose exploited people. So there are these three white kids who grow up in America in a mansion in Beverly Hills, and then their parents die. And for a few years, things are not good. But then they're going to become multimillionaires again. You know, isn't that just like some <laughs> suffering ethnic minority who's living in abject poverty and you know what I mean somebody in Central Africa in like a war zone see I care about exploited people and it's like do you think that that's equivalent that those are <laughs> that those two things are even close to the same that you're out of your mind right like does who yeah. who has an interest in like oh boo hoo the poor trust fund kid like <laughs> honestly who is that speaking to that yeah, they're not that, exactly no, exploited people. Um, right. I mean, they are victims, but it is not equivalent to mm -hmm. the level of victimization uh, that some people experience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, it, all that is just to say that this passage is clearly Snicket, in my mind. Snicket certainly, whether Handler is, but Snicket is certainly setting himself up as being equivalent to Melville, yeah. which is also kind of interesting and i promise I, i'm not going to make this all about melville but it's interesting because melville was totally neglected he was during his lifetime like mm -hmm. when he died moby dick was out of print literally wow. you couldn't even buy it it was a commercial failure he did not make money from writing moby dick critics it, he got mixed reviews but generally speaking critics did not like moby dick it was only mm -hmm. well after he died that it became incredibly popular and became the great American novel and one of the greatest American novels ever written and one of the, the best novels ever written as far as like the, um, the common acceptance within the literary community. So mm -hmm. it took a long time after he died, like a couple decades after before it really became popularized. Um, you know, even Shakespeare was the same way. Shakespeare had very popular right. plays, but he was not considered to be a great writer by any means in right. his in his um within his lifetime so setting yourself up as melville i kind of like that because he's caught snicket is constantly saying nobody reads these books right. that <laughs> you know these are not popular nobody should possibly read this it is too 
dark and you can just skip ahead and I can bury all of these messages to my sister in the books because they're being neglected anyway. Right. right. So I'm telling people not to read them. So therefore people are not reading them. But I'm like, it kind of makes sense with Melville of like he published Moby Dick and nobody cared. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Melville's such a great example of that, like for for every is struggling writer to go, well, nobody appreciated Melville in his time. <laughs> right. But it still doesn't matter. You're like, so what if after I'm dead, people like my books? What difference does that make? <laughs> I need money now. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Yeah, that's, that's a great discussion there, man. Um, all right. So I only have one other note for chapter two, which is on page uh, 41 which is when uh, Sonny says Sue, or Seuss, as some people Sue. say it. I, yeah, I, I know that it's Sue, but I, I feel like many yeah. people would read it as Seuss and uh, right. not get that it is um, a reference to being a sous chef, which is the inferior or the... Uh, uh, under. Yeah, Sue the under. under. Yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, and, and so that's just nice, the way that that's in there. And again... Yeah. Uh, this site that I found that makes all kinds of connections with all these other words, strangely did not find <laughs> that that is based on the French word. I found that website <laughs> as well, and I okay. briefly went through it and I went, never mind. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> it was yeah. not great. It was not yeah. great. Um, I, I appreciate the fact that somebody has taken so much time to try to do it, but Absolutely. E yeah. even you and I puzzling over these and really considering and researching there's many times where we say i still don't know what it could possibly mean mm -hmm. and yeah. so i'm just saying that it, it's it's a tough task but i did yeah. look and i went mm, you missed that one Ooh, you missed that one but yeah i i like that passage i have that marked as well because uh the captain is referring to sunny so he says of course the captain cried naturally our other crewman has been in charge of cooking, but all he does is make these terrible damp casseroles. I'm tired of them. I'm hoping your cooking skills might improve our meal situation. Sue, Sonny said modestly, which meant something like, I haven't been cooking for very long. Um, because they're, they're talking about how she's such a great chef. And then she is being modest here. She's going, I'm not a chef. I'm a sous chef. Like, at best, a right. sous chef. You know, that I, I need to learn, like, because a sous chef is under. And you don't even start out as a sous chef. Right, right. <laughs> within a kitchen, but you know, I, I need to be under an actual chef to learn an apprentice and spend a fair bit of time. Like, even if I am the head chef in this kitchen, I am not a chef because that's right. an actual term that means something. And yeah, 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 yeah no, absolutely. Um, all right, so those were my notes for chapter two. Okay, um, let me see what else I had. So we've we've talked about Ishmael, so that part's fine. And then uh, on page 34, then the middle of this page, starting with having, because uh, this is in reference to Captain Wittershin's personal philosophy, where he says uh, he or she who hesitates is lost. Mm -hmm. Right, and he's saying that he he lives by that. Yeah. So it says in the middle of page thirty four, having a personal philosophy is like having a pet marmoset because it may be very attractive when you acquire it, but there may be situations when it will not come in handy at all. And um, and then it it goes on explaining all of this, and I, I just you've got basically two pages going over this, and I really like that I've delivered something to the effect of, of this as a lesson multiple times of the mm. trouble with aphorisms or, you know, expressions, right. cliches, um, you proverbs. know, pro proverbs, exactly. <laughs> uh, that, you know, and, and proverbs, not the book of proverbs, but just right. any wise saying, just to clarify, yeah. that uh, the problem is if it's sort of like allegory if you look too closely it falls apart yeah. and if you apply this too directly and too consistently regardless of the situation it's going to fall apart it will not be applicable yeah like it's just so people who say that because it's such a conversation ender most people who say this are, are I, I got to be honest, I found most people who like using cliched expressions are not terribly deep thinkers. Mm. They, they hear something and they go, that makes sense. 
So therefore they say it, but it's to shut you up. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's if you're complaining about something, they say it as though they've just made some significant contribution to the conversation, right? Yeah. Of, you know, well, I'm not sure if I should do this or if I should do this or if I should do this. You know, he who hesitates is lost. It's like, well, are you interested in listening to the complexity <laughs> of my situation or did you just want to throw out a random cliche? Because here's how your cliche is, is inapplicable in a whole bunch of situations. Yeah. And, I just appreciated the fact, because like I said, I have done that lesson multiple times where I'll point out, here's one, here's one, here's another aphorism, another one, another one. But if we take this too literally. So that's the problem is if you live your life according to these things. It's If you live your life according to bumper stickers, like <laughs> that's that's not that's not real problem solving. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's 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 interesting because it just reminds me of Metal Gear Solid. Um, you know, with uh, Mei Ling, uh, then she's always telling you these, you know, aphorisms or proverbs. Um, and you as the character snake just kind of go, oh, okay, that makes sense. You know, that makes sense. Sure. In this one situation, he does challenge her in a couple of them, you know, giving uh -huh. a contrary one. And then in Metal Gear Solid 2, then Otacon <laughs> tries to take over that role and so he's reading off these proverbs but he has no idea what they really mean <laughs> and so he's like uh so that means uh wait where do i put my notes uh it means this and so he's just like are you sure you got that right <laughs> <laughs> exactly um, and he's just clearly getting them all wrong and so yeah it's it's it, it is really uh yeah it's, it's really interesting to get you know the full two pages uh yeah. pointing out how like there's an expression for everything and they contradict each other and yes. you can't just live by all of them and you can't just pick and choose which ones you want to live by. No. They can be, yeah, a way of simplifying things, but don't take them to the extreme. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I guess like, cause the way I typically explain it is I say, just because it's an expression doesn't mean that it's true. Right. A lot of people yes. think because it's an expression, it's therefore truth. Right. You know, and, and I, that's why they just say, and then like expect the conversation to end. I'm just like, oh, okay. I don't think I want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> this is just not helpful. And uh, right. yeah. All right. Um, the, my last note for chapter two is on page 41 towards the bottom. Mm -hmm. And this we already had that mention of the the sous chef but then um sorry this is actually at the top of the page i apologize uh where you've got the the captain so from the bottom of 40 into the top of 41 i the captain said i haven't forgotten you sonny i'd never forget sonny never in a million years not that i will live that long particularly because i don't exercise very much <laughs> but i don't like exercising so it's worth it <laughs> Uh, why well, I remember when they wouldn't let me go mountain climbing because I hadn't trained it properly. And, and then he continued <laughs> Um, I just, it's a funny little thing, but it, it's consistent with Snicket. Yeah. Snicket does not think much of exercise and Absolutely. doesn't point out that it's a problem. And even just, you know, oh, well, I won't live till a million years because I don't exercise. As if that's the cost of not exercising. Oh, you won't live to be a million if you don't exercise. <laughs> like you might make it to 900,000 years old. And that's why. Right. What, what's the difference really? Instead of saying, well, you're just going to feel terrible all the time if you don't exercise. <laughs> like there's never any discussion like that. There's never any justification for exercise in these books whatsoever. Yeah. Which is yeah. fine. It's just, it's a, it's a snicket thing. Absolutely. All right. And that was it for chapter two. All right. Do you want to keep going with uh, chapter three then? Sure. On page 48, it's just a quick note. Then you've got um, this whole section here where it talks about the, the children. They did not want to get moving, right? The children looked at one another in frustration. They did not want to get moving. It felt to the Baudelaire orphans that they had been moving almost constantly since that terrible day at the beach when their lives had been turned upside down. They had moved into Count Olaf's home and then moved into the home of various guardians. And then it continues on. And it's just, it's backstory that he's just dumping all of the backstory there. I don't think it's bad. I think yeah. it's it's fairly well done in the way he introduces it of them mm -hmm. saying, 
like our lives ever since the fire and ever since we became orphans, we've just been moving from one place to another, to another, to another. And so now we have to continue on on this journey. And when is it ever going to end that they're tired from this and they're just tired of traveling? And so that is a good reason for Snicket to then provide backstory. And he's not providing it in such a way it, it, it can be helpful for somebody who has not necessarily read all of the books, but even if you have read all of the books up until this point, it's a good little refresher. Yeah, because absolutely. very likely most kids reading the books, well, I mean, I, I don't know about very likely, but many kids reading the books have not read them in such quick su succession as we have. So right. I look at them and I'm like, well, I remember all of this stuff because we've read it very recently. But yeah. um, if it took a, a kid, you know, a couple of years to potentially get through the series, you know, to wait for another book to get released and all mm -hmm. of that, you know, reread the earlier ones. So that's a good way of just reminding the reader. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it is also, um, it's interesting that it's, because uh, we had talked before about, like, we don't really know what the time frame is in, in these books, you know, how much time has been passing. Uh, and we sort of mentioned it last week, but they now have a very clear, deadline of okay we only have five days for yeah you know, to get to hotel du Numont. and so yeah and so here to have it just be like yeah it felt like there was just things happening over you know just one after another after another after another and there was never a break and it's like yeah that's kind of what we've been reading but it still doesn't really clarify how long these things have been and i think it's kind of to the children and it would just feel like it just hasn't stopped. Like, it's just kept going. Yeah. We do have a mention of the fact that Violet is almost 15. That's true. Yeah. So we know that it has not been two years. It's been yeah. approximately a year, almost a year. Because when right. it started, she was 14. Yes. Yeah. And and we already had uh, Klaus had, have a birthday. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because I think he was almost 12 at the beginning. And then he became uh, 12. Is that right? He turned 12? Uh, I no, I believe he was 12. And then he turned 13. Oh, uh, OK. In uh, the Vile Village. So it's more like a year and a half that separates them. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. OK. Um, it's just odd that Sonny is so much younger than them. But <laughs> it happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, and then on page 51, this is my last note for chapter three, then this is when they meet Phil again, or they, they reacquaint themselves with Phil. And um, let me see. I just, like, the, I really enjoyed almost everything <laughs> with Phil. He's <laughs> such a funny character. He is. <laughs> and um, anyway, so it, it says at the top of 51, uh, Oh, uh, maybe I'll go from the bottom of 50. So he says, I'll bring you some lemon lime, Phil said. Sailors should always make sure there's plenty of citrus in their system. I'm so glad to see you, children. You know, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. I was so horrified after what happened in Paltryville that I couldn't stay at Lucky Smells. And since then, my life has been one big adventure. I'm sorry that your leg never healed, Klaus said, referring to Phil's limp. I didn't realize the accident with the stamping machine was so serious. It's like, number one, how did you not realize that that accident was so serious? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, come on. Um, Anyway, that's not why I'm limping, Phil said. I was bitten by a shark last week. It was very painful, but I'm quite lucky. Most people never get an opportunity to get so close to such a deadly animal. <laughs> like, everything is just so great. And this is, I, I think it's, it's a criticism of optimists, mm -hmm. right? People who are just so ridiculously optimistic about everything that it's absurd. Yeah, that, you know, oh, for every cloud, there's a silver lining. And it's like, my leg got bit off by a shark. And it's like, a lot of people don't get to be so close to sharks. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, sometimes tragedy is tragedy. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> anyway, then it continues. The Baudelaire's watched him as he limped back through the kitchen door, whistling a bouncy tune. Was Phil always optimistic when you knew him? Fiona asked. Always, Violet said. And her siblings nodded in agreement. We've never known anyone who could remain so cheerful, no matter um, what terrible things occurred. To tell you the truth, I sometimes find it a bit tiresome, Fiona said, adjusting her triangular glasses. Shall we find you some uniforms? And so I just pointed out that a lot of people feel that way about optimists, mm -hmm. optimistic people, but they also feel that way about pessimistic people. If yeah. somebody is always pessimistic, then 
that's no fun to be around. If somebody's always optimistic, that's no fun to be around. Yeah. And, you know, I think most people tend to, you know, trend one way or the other, but somewhere in the middle, right? Mm. That yeah. generally when things are good, then t people tend to be fairly optimistic and yeah. hopeful about life. But then when things go badly, then they don't act as though, you know, they have to be happy about this, right? That, yeah. that to me is like a normal person. Right. But, <laughs> but people who are just so heavily in, you know, one camp or the other can be tiresome. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And, and just... Um, it, with that passage, uh, this is unrelated, but um, at the very beginning of what you read there, uh, when Phil says, I'll bring you some lemon lime, um, it's it's interesting because in the previous book, I had meant to bring it up, but one of the things that was in the fridge was uh, lemon juice, and then Snicket describes how the pickle needed to be in a coated sandwich. Yep. And his name is Lemony. And so I'm wondering if the lemon juice was supposed to signal that, like, you know, there was a message for him. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I know. I went, that that would make sense. And I didn't, yeah, I didn't have time to, uh, or I just forgot to mention it last time. And so this just <laughs> reminded me of that. And I was like, oh, right. <laughs> yeah. No, that that's an interesting point. I'm sure there's something to it. Mm hmm Because he said that it was his pickle. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> so, he really did. Um, all right. Did you have any other notes for chapter three? No. All right. And I didn't either. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, that was uh, my only note, just about the lemon lime. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Well, why don't you go first then with chapter four? Sure. All right. So starting off, uh, let me see. Um, man, uh, my first note here is, um, it's at the top of page 76, um, really 75 into 76, um, but, uh, I'm just going to start from the top of 76. Uh, we don't have time for you to, to do all that flirting either. We're not flirting, Fiona said. We're having a conversation. It looked like flirting to me, the captain said. I, <laughs> um, and I just, uh, and then of course, Violet is just like, why don't you tell us about your research? <laughs> um, yeah, and so I think that it's just, it, that worked really well for me. I don't know about you, but I was like, yeah, that that can happen, you know, for like kids where, you know, maybe there's something, but please don't talk about it. And as soon as you mention it, then it's like this whole, oh, you're reading too much into it and, and all that. I don't know. <laughs> it worked for me, but I think they genuinely are flirting here. Yes, yeah. And uh, yeah, of course, she doesn't want the she doesn't want um, Captain Wittershins to point this out because that right. is embarrassing. I mean, I think regardless of uh, of your age, flirting is supposed to be th this thing where it's meant to to be. You're supposed to flirt in such a way that it can be interpreted as just being polite or friendly right. as casual conversation. Right. That if if it doesn't work on both levels, then it's not flirting anymore. And mm -hmm. it can quickly become sexual harassment if it's not reciprocated, <laughs> right? <laughs> if if yeah. you go beyond flirting, right? And so flirting has to be fairly subtle, but you can't go so subtle that the other person doesn't even recognize what's happening here. But the second yeah. that somebody points it out, then it's like, well, it's no longer flirting anymore because it's no longer being heard as two different things. Mm, you know, yes. it's no longer interpretive. So right. I think that's the problem is that if you're flirting with somebody and then somebody says like, hey, stop flirting, then even if you are, and even if the other person knows it, even if everybody knows it, you still have to play this social game right. and you pretend that that's not what's actually happening. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it, it's just a, such a, uh, such a realistic moment. It, it's, it is it's something that happens in the real world that happens exactly like that. It is, yeah, it, very effective. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've got notes on this, so I might as well go over this since we're in this passage. So, uh, just from that middle, the middle of page 75 and, um, 
you know, Klaus says, I guess the second paragraph there, you misunderstood me, Klaus said quickly. All I meant was that it's easier to research something that's interesting. You sound like Fiona, the captain said. When I want her to research the life of Herman Melville, she works slowly, but she's quick as a whip when the subject is mushrooms. Mushrooms, Klaus asked. Are you a mycologist? It is mycologist, right? Not mycologist. Mycologist I is a hard so. Yeah, yeah. I, I've got to imagine it is. Fiona smiled, and her eyes grew wide behind her triangular glasses. I never thought I'd meet someone who knew that word, she said. Besides, yes, I'm a mycologist. I've been interested in fungi all my life. If we have some time, sorry, if we have time, I'll show you my mycological library. Time, Captain Wershins repeated. And so I just, I've, I, I couldn't help myself, but I'm just like, man, Klaus has got to take this as an opportunity to, to go for it, right? That she's very right. interested in fungi. And, and then, you know, just say, say something like, you know, hey, I'm a fungi myself. You should <laughs> check me out, <laughs> right? <laughs> Or, yeah. hey, since I'm such a fun guy, you better take me to a dark room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, Get me to a cold, dark place. <laughs> oh, man. It reminds me of a, uh, a school camping trip that I went on once where, um, you know, one of the uh, uh, one of the people there, then she was, you know, teaching us uh, about lichen. Uh -huh. uh, which is like you know moss that grows on on, on rocks yeah. and uh you know the one kid in our class and he he's like oh yeah like i know about lichen you know it's this and it's that and then she's like oh you're you're a, a pretty smart guy and then like you know the class kind of went Ooh. and i was like and i didn't think about it in time but i wanted so badly to say looks like she's liking you right exactly <laughs> Those puds are my wheelhouse, and I love them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I figured you would like that. But I'm just yeah. saying to anybody, if you are, if you're ever flirting with a, uh, with a, a mycologist specifically, your guy flirting with a mycologist, and then to just say, well, you know, I've been known to be a bit of a fun guy myself. You <laughs> yes. know, check this fun guy out, like whatever, right? Like, how often do you get to say fun guy? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> anyway, that was all I, I wanted to point out there. Okay. Uh, my next note is at the bottom of page 77. Um, and this is the discussion of Anne Wilson Aquatics. Uh, it's a marine research center and a rhetorical advice service. Um, uh, or it was, it burned down. Of course, another fire. Anne Whistle Violet asked, that was Aunt Josephine's last name. I, the captain said, Anne Whistle Aquatics was founded by Gregor Anne Whistle, the famous uh, I Ichnologist, yeah. Ichnologist um, and Josephine's brother-in-law. So I did look up what an Ichnologist is, Ichnologist, sorry. Um, and it doesn't seem to have much relevance. It's just a random thing. It is uh, someone who studies trace fossils those marks preserved in the fossil record uh, that show evidence of the activity of organisms. Okay. Yeah, I know. I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have bothered looking it up. Because <laughs> we many... moved past it so quickly. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay. There's... How many Ichnologists do you think there are in the world? <laughs> Three. <laughs> I know. I was going to say three. Like they have a conference and it's like they, they book a hotel. They don't even have to book a conference room. Just we'll just meet in the suite. We'll just get a suite and we'll just meet in the living room area <laughs> for our like the, you know, oh, this is so great. I've been invited to the World Icnology Conference. And it's like, what, you and Ted? <laughs> like, <laughs> right. like two, three people. <laughs> It just seems yeah. that so many scientists and archaeologists, that'd be part of their job, but not the entirety mm. of their job, where they yeah. would then have that as a title. That's all right. that I mean by that. It's just so obscure. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. And, and so I don't know why he put that reference in there or that either. that specific <laughs> word. I'm like, that's so random. And I don't remember if it comes back at all, but I don't really think that it does. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, so moving on uh, to page 87, uh, and this is my last note, is uh, just as reference to uh, Plato's cave. Um, there was a philosopher who said that all of life is just shadows. He said that people who are just sitting 
that people were just sitting in a cave watching shadows on the cave wall. Eye shadows of something much bigger and grander than themselves. Well, that sonar detector is like our cave wall, showing us the shape of things much more powerful and terrifying. That's, mm. it's not a great, <laughs> you know, explanation of the allegory of uh, Plato's cave. Um, no, it's not <laughs> a good explanation of Plato's allegory of the cave by any no. means. <laughs> yeah. Um, as far as trying to explain what that thing is, it's not bad. It's, That's true. It, because if you, because I think it functions on a couple levels. I've got this marked as well. But in Plato's allegory of the cave, and you have the prisoners in the cave where they're watching the shadows on the wall, but the shadows are shadows of puppets that are going on behind them where there's the light source. And then you have the, the puppets themselves that are trying to represent real things. But the puppets are of course, reproductions and poor characterizations of what the real thing actually is. And then if you go out um, out of the cave, then you'll see the the real thing, right? This It's Plato's idea of forms and things and yeah. um, that if you go out into the world, then the real thing is so much different than the shadow compared to even the puppet that you're so many layers removed from it. So it's basically saying, you can't understand it even when you're looking directly at it because it's still just a thing and it's not the form itself. And it's right. a shadow of the thing uh, or a reproduction of the thing, right? Mm -hmm. That you're like, I guess, like three or four removed from the real thing itself. So as far as trying to explain, it's this vast, unknowable, incomprehensible mystery that we can only get a glimpse of it, but not truly understand it. Then I'm like, Plato's allegory of the cave, I guess, sort of works in introducing that. But this is very much a HP Lovecraft device. Oh, okay. that's what Lovecraft does is essentially there are these vast, incomprehensible forces in the, the world, um, consciousnesses, uh, beings that are so beyond human understanding that to even get a glimpse of them will drive a person mad right mm. getting into like the cthulhu mythos and right. all of that that it's just there are, are, are things once you tap into other dimensions then you would just go crazy from even a glimpse of it um it, it would drive a person mad because it's so beyond our understanding of what can possibly be that it's very much a lovecraft um like he's evoking Lovecraft here. Mm. Okay, that's really interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know what to make of it, but I like it. I, I, I like even just passing references to to Lovecraft. Right. Um, yeah. Um, all right. Well, do you have any other notes for chapter four? Um, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've I've got several in here, so I'll, I'll be I'll be brief though. On page 65, it's such a weird example that we have here uh, where this is describing what's going on with um, the Baudelaire's starting from towards the, the top of the page um, where it says, for a long time, for a long time, the Baudelaire's had felt as if their lives were a damaged Frisbee tossed from person to person from place to place without ever really being appreciated or fitting in. Uh, and then it continues on with this Frisbee metaphor and I'm just like, like a Frisbee? <laughs> like a damaged <laughs> yeah. Frisbee? Of all things to compare them to, of all similes, you know, they felt like they were a damaged <laughs> Frisbee being tossed from person. I'm like, who would even, if you had a damaged Frisbee, would you even bother playing with it? No. <laughs> right, that's what I'm saying. If it's, if it's broken in some way, if it's broken so badly that it won't fly, nobody would throw it. Or if it's broken and it's like got a big chip in it, then you're like, if I catch it, I'm going to cut myself very likely. Right. So if it's damaged, you will not play with a damaged frisbee. It just made no sense. But I think it's supposed to not make sense. It's supposed to be another example of Ticket trying to give a, a, a good metaphor here and just failing. Yeah. That he's sort of got it of it's being tossed from person to person. Like, right. okay, but there's a lot of things get tossed from person to person. Like, I don't know, like a bad penny. You know what I mean? Maybe that <laughs> right. would look better. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, all right. And then we talked about that part on page 77. Then 
there's a, a couple things here. So it says um, from that first paragraph on page 77, it's too small, Klaus said. Oceans are in constant motion, and an object that falls into the sea could end up miles away. It appears that the tides and currents in this part of the ocean would take the sugar bowl past the Gulag archipelago here, and then head down toward the mediocre barrier reef before turning at this point here, which is marked AA. Um, I think there's multiple things going on here, but certainly Gulag archipelago. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this. Um, okay, so it is one of the most significant books from the 20th century. Um, it's, um, I, I mean, many, it has many proponents, and it is written by a, a Russian writer, a Soviet writer, um, talking about the Gulag system within right. the Soviet Union. He wrote it in the, the 60s, and it, it covers, it's incredibly popular in English. Historians uh, absolutely love this book because it, it's, considered to be, I guess, the, the preeminent text on the what happened within the gulags of the Soviet Union, the level of depravity and the terrifying conditions, uh, the level of death and suffering that went on, and as a, a, a critique of communism and specifically the Soviet implementation of communism, of just, you know, uh, I mean, it, I hesitate to make any comparisons, but in terms of like, we think about Holocaust literature, right? And there's many books. I mean, Holocaust literature is an entire subfield within the literary world that the Gulag Archipelago would be at the very top, like within the top 10 for books about communism and specifically the horrors of what happened during the, the Soviet era in Russia. Okay. And so, yeah, and that's written by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Uh, Solzhenitsyn. Okay. Yeah, cool. it's very, very popular. Um, and and in some ways, increasingly popular, which is, uh, it's kind of had a, a resurgence that, um, because uh, whatever you think of him, um, Jordan Peterson, who's infamous, I, I would say infamous is probably better than famous. I some people would say he's famous, some people would say he's infamous, but the U of T professor, you know what I mean? Number one, New York yeah. bestseller, 12 rules for life, all of that stuff with, yeah, there's a whole long thing with him. But he has he cites that book all the time as being incredibly significant and kind of as a result of his popularity, the book has picked up in popularity. But it was already incredibly popular well before he repopularized it. I don't know what Snicket is doing or Handler is doing by including a reference to that other than just like yeah, the Soviets, what they did to their own people in the gulag system is, like, terrible. Like, I mean, Stalin is maybe the greatest mass murderer in history. <laughs> you know, like, legitimately. Like, it's a, it's a yeah. little, like, it's hard to even tell because they, you know, of course, repressed the numbers. And it's like right. him or what happened during, like, with the Maoist revolution or, you know, certainly Hitler is up there. I mean, like, when you're talking about this level, <laughs> yeah, then... It's just like, just overall awful, evil, but um, indefensible, right? Yeah. There's there's no way you can um, defend any of that stuff uh, of what was going on. So I don't know why he would bring that up. Yeah, I, I just thought that it was a reference to the Gulag. Um, and that was all that I read into it. I didn't know that uh, Gulag Archipelago is an actual text. An so. actual book and very yeah. popular nonfiction book. Um, yeah, and so then continuing on with that section, so then he's got, and then head down toward the mediocre barrier reef, which is supposed to be a play on Great Barrier Reef. Right. right. <laughs> Before turning at this point here, which is marked AA. Do you not think that that's maybe a reference to Alcoholics Anonymous? They oh, have a turning that's interesting. point in your life, and you go to <laughs> AA? I think it's supposed to be a pun on that. Wow, right? that's really interesting. Because when I saw AA, then I... I my mind instantly went to A.A. A. Milne, who wrote oh, Winnie yeah. the Pooh. Yeah. Um, and then there is also uh, the house at Pooh Corner. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, that's that's really interesting here. Interpretation. <laughs> I don't know. I just like <laughs> before turning at this point here, which is marked A.A. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
I kind of think I'm right. And it's supposed to be. And then I had this turning point in my life, and I knew I had to go to AA. You're right. <laughs> and it's just like these random things. I'm like, so you've got Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago. You've got mm-hmm. mediocre barrier reef just playing off of Great Barrier Reef. Uh, you've got a little pun on AA all <laughs> in <right>. one sentence. <laughs> That's our going. Like this is like th- these are some of the strongest chapters in the entire series, and that <laughs> is layered um, and is rewarding to really think about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then on page eighty, this is the last section that I have here. So it goes over um, at the. The bottom of 80, with that paragraph, this is Captain Wittershins uh, speaking, where Captain Wittershins stood up from the table and began crying out in astonishment. I, he cried, dear God, holy Buddha, Charles Darwin, Duke Ellington, I, Fiona, turn off the engines, I, Cookie, turn off the stove. Um, So we actually have a reference to God where it's capitalized, which is surprising, because I think that's the first time we've seen that in this entire book series. Then you have Holy Buddha. Um, Buddha is not would not be referred to as holy, but right. um, anyway, so it's like, okay, so you've got Dear God capitalized, whatever your faith background, if you are in a monotheistic uh, religion, then you would believe in God, not God, so it should be capitalized because there's not multiple gods, right? But there is the one true God, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe other um, demigods but like posing as God, but God should be capitalized according to monotheistic religions. And then Holy Buddha, I'm like, okay, so you've got Buddhism, and then Charles Darwin, and then Duke Ellington, right, the great jazz musician. But, yeah. like, he's, to me, he's subverting the religious significance of God and Buddha by then throwing in Charles Darwin and then Duke Ellington. Yeah. That saying they're all equivalent. Right. Um, that it, it's saying, God is just the same as Buddha, who is just the same as Charles Darwin, who is just the same as Duke Ellington. They're all, they're all, like, amazing people, right? Right. Charles Darwin is yeah. an amazing figure, and Duke Ellington is an amazing figure. Buddha, an amazing figure, and God, just an amazing figure. They're all the same. So if you're cursing, right, that you, you don't um, take the the name of the Lord in vain. Right. Right. According to the the Old Testament. And so it's he's swearing, he's cursing here. So he is taking God's name in vain, but then also Buddha's name and also Darwin's name and also Duke Ellington's name. And the the other thing, too, it's obviously really significant that he chooses Darwin because it just I I even just did a little drawing in my notes here um, on my post-it note of the ichthys. Um, You know what I'm talking about? The Christian symbol of the fish. Ah, yes. Yeah. So that's an ichthys. And um, I just drew that with the legs underneath, like yeah. that Darwinists use. And then, like, often people have, like, the word Darwin in there. Um, right. That it's people who, it, it, it's definitely, to me, it's a pot shot at Christians. Yeah. Wait, you see that? It's a, uh, I'm going to mock you that yeah, I believe yeah. in evolution. I don't believe in God. I'm a secular humanist. Um, and so just like you're parading around with your religion in my face, with your ichthys on the back of your car, I'm going to get back at you with Darwin on the back of my car. But that's effectively what he's doing in text here, in prose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's no, going, absolutely. that Christian idea of taking the God's name in vain, Darwin. Darwin's my God, but he's not a God. Right. right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's the inclusion of Duke Ellington that, like, really threw me off. I was like, that's so weird. But <laughs> the only thing I can yeah. think is just because he's just such a spectacular jazz musician. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> that it's just, like, he's incredibly admirable in the jazz world, like right. Darwin is for biologists. Mm. I don't yeah. know. I guess so. Like, But to me, it's just continuing to create this equivalency between all of them Mm -hmm. um okay so i have a question here because i'm seeing the the nickname cookie written here yeah Uh, and it makes me wonder in um in moby dick does the cook get referred to as cookie or anything oh it's been so long i can't remember because that would be interesting if that was because Witterson says, oh, I don't even know why I use that nickname. But that would be interesting if it was something mm. like that. 
Um, yeah, that could be. It's been so long uh, that I'm not quite sure, but that that very well could be. Mm -hmm. um, and another note on this page, um, I know that like, you know I'm I'm done with my notes, but then I I did also want to mention uh, Sunny saying Yom Huladet, which is uh, Hebrew for uh, birthday. Um, which oh yeah okay. <laughs> you know, she's like, oh yeah, we've arranged a surprise dessert for tomorrow morning, and the oh. way she says it is birthday. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Whose um, birthday is it supposed to be? Uh, that's a good question. Is it Violet's? Because I'd imagine me. that it probably is, since it mentions that she's almost fifteen, and right. we got the same thing that happened in the Vile Village. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And yeah, I did not um, look that up and I wasn't sure if that was a word or not, but that makes sense. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, so it seems like maybe Violet and um, Klaus are not exactly Jewish, but it seems more and more likely that Sonny is Jewish. <laughs> Does it not? <laughs> yes, that's a good point. I know <laughs> that he gets to use her to say anything that's like she's saying stuff in all kinds of languages, like Japanese. I know she said like in the last book, um, then, you know, she throws out arigato and yeah whatever else but <laughs> still kind of seems like she's maybe jewish yep <laughs> <laughs> but not violet and klaus right <laughs> um yeah no that's <laughs> that's a good point um all right well i guess we're gonna move on then yeah yeah um uh yeah so we're moving on to chapters five to eight uh, they are off on their way toward Anwhistle Aquatics um, to hopefully find the Sugar Bowl. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then we've got this mysterious question mark thing floating around, and Olaf has got a submarine. Uh, how is it that... Why does Olaf need money if the dude literally owns a submarine? <laughs> it's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> you know what they say about money... You can always use more of it. I don't know. <laughs> I guess, right? You know what boat stands for? Bust out another thousand. <laughs> right? They're just like, it literally, you just sink money into boats. Um, right. So maybe that's why I'm not giving up my submarine. I don't care how many orphans I have to kill and how many parents of theirs I have to like, you know. I mean, he even has that huge house. <laughs> yeah. He's so, got a big house. He owns yeah. a submarine, apparently, or he's at least got access to a submarine. Right. And, but he needs more money. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> How did he get in the submarine that quickly? I don't know. <laughs> no. But whatever. And how, how are they driving a submarine down a stream? <laughs> it's, it's apparently a, a very deep stream. <laughs> Even the deepest rivers, I don't think you can get any decent sized submarine. Um, but okay. Yeah. I'll go with it. <laughs> yeah. All right. It is uh, a ton of fun so far. Um, yeah, no, it is. It is. I, I, I really enjoyed the first four chapters, and I hope that it holds out because mm -hmm. uh, I haven't enjoyed the first four chapters in any of the the books, at least not in a while, as much right. as I enjoyed these four. And um, it, yeah, we'll, we'll see how how it continues on. Um, well, yeah, is that? Oh, I'm just looking at the cover now, and yeah, I think it, it, that's Melville on the front, right? Uh, yes, like on the front of the uniform. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's fairly well done. I like that. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, yeah. One other thing. Um, Fiona and Klaus are about three years apart, I guess. Uh-huh. So, at, least, at least two. Mm-hmm. Because didn't you say he's 13? Is it, isn't she 15? Uh, it said that she is, looked a little older than Violet, I think is how it was described. Almost 15. But so. It right. Could, That's true. I don't true. know if it's like she's already yeah. 15, like a little older, like six or eight months or something like that. Or if it's like right. a year or two. But mm -hmm. I just assumed that she was 15. So, yeah, he's going for the older lady. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Go oh, well. Klaus? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all, right, all right, folks. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Feel free to comment below, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.
Ignore the tattoo! A phrase here which means like, comment, subscribe, and share this podcast across the web. That may seem like a strange definition, but in this context, it is entirely accurate.